I'm Bob Osterhout. I appreciate your interest in this topic. Media literacy and social justice require clear thinking. They require an ability to look at things from different perspectives and a capacity to integrate information from a variety of sources. Media literacy expects us to evaluate intent, bias, and the technique used to communicate, as well as the content of a message. Social justice requires an understanding of history and context, careful planning, forethought, the ability to adapt to changing conditions. Fear and clear thinking are like oil and water. They don't mix. One sits on top of the other. We saw rivers burning in the 70s because so much oil had built up on top of the water. In the past few decades, the media has become a primary vehicle for connecting with others. It's also been turned into a highly effective means for manipulation and misinformation. The most common and effective tool for manipulation is fear. Fear is used to get and keep our attention. It's used to entice us to buy things, to influence our opinion, to get us to vote for or more likely against someone. We live in the information age, but we don't agree on what information is useful, helpful, or even true. Media literacy helps us understand how sources of misinformation operate. Many of them operate through fear. I believe media literacy needs to include emotional literacy, specifically an understanding of what fear is, how it works, and how to navigate through and around it. Fear creates a solid wall of bias that isolates us from others and insulates us from their point of view. We only see what's inside these walls. Everything outside the walls is framed by threats that we imagine from within. Facts can't penetrate walls built on fear. Attempts to convince people that there may be another way of looking at things only results in making the wall stronger and thicker. Media literacy and social justice that address the issue of fear can put windows in those walls with relationships that build trust through respect and acceptance. A larger, clearer perspective emerges that allows those previously locked in by fear to build a door that unlocks curiosity as it opens minds and hearts. In the ancient world, justice was seen as a process of restoring relationships. Modern man has redefined it as getting even. We can't be even when we're disconnected. It's only when we connect with others that we can fully realize our own potential and purpose. I believe the most challenging mission in social justice is to connect with others, to restore relationships. Enacting laws and changing policies are important, but real lasting progress is realized through improved relationships. Fear is cancer to relationships. Politics today is defined more by what we're against than what we're for, and mostly we seem to be against each other. What we're against is what we're told to be afraid of. I worked as a psychologist and a clinical social worker for over 45 years. I taught at a community college for 40 years. In the 90s, I developed an empowerment program that was owned and operated by people in poverty. It's called the Hard Times Cafe. I facilitated over a thousand of their meetings over eight years. As I look back over people I've been honored to work with, I see that fear played a role in virtually every problem they brought to me, and that getting past fear was a significant part of every solution. My first clinical job was as a residential facility where I was assigned the unit where they sent everyone who had problems with violence. I worked with people who had difficulty with violence throughout my career. I got a lot of referrals from people who were suffering from anxiety and PTSD because what I had learned about dealing with fear was consistently helpful in helping them to recover. I was really lucky as an undergraduate back in the 60s to study under Dr. Ralph Lewis, a biologist at Michigan State. He saw education not so much as a process of accumulating information, but as a way of understanding how things work and why, a way to open the door to creativity and to asking good questions and seeking their answers. The focus on his teaching was identifying essential concepts and core principles. We kept in touch for over 20 years. He challenged me to apply this thinking to my work, asking me to identify and continually fine tune the essential concepts and core principles of what was consistently effective. He encouraged me to describe them in simple terms that led to practical application. Over the years, I realized that counseling was much simpler than untangling a history of various diagnoses. It was also much more than teaching skills or managing symptoms. 
It was simply a process of removing obstacles that kept people from being themselves. The biggest and most common obstacle was fear. I worked with a 16-year-old girl who was brought to my office directly from the hospital after giving birth to her son. The social worker described her family as totally dysfunctional and her live-in boyfriend as immature and self-centered. She was sitting in my office with her baby screaming as she held her, and I could see that she was screaming on the inside with fear. I asked if I could hold the baby, and I put him gently to my chest as I breathed slowly and deeply, and he stopped crying and fell asleep. I explained to the mother what I was doing and how maintaining balance and learning to calm herself would make it easier to care for her balance, her, her, for her baby. I told her that motherhood was part of nature. All humans and most mammals had an inborn capacity to be good mothers. She needed to allow that pet capacity to come through and to learn to understand and respond to her child needs. In order to do that, she had to get fear out of the way. I saw her regularly for about six weeks and to be perfectly honest, didn't do much except help her see the situation more clearly and do a bit of problem solving. Mostly I just applauded her progress. Her boyfriend and family noticed the change in her and her love for her baby opened their hearts. She gently confronted them about issues that were causing problems with sensitivity and compassion at the right time and with the right tone, and they responded appropriately. The social worker planned to have continued contact and agreed to let me know if there were problems, so we ended treatment. I didn't see her again until four years later when I brought my daughter to a medical appointment. She was there with her son. She had gotten married to her previous boyfriend. Her husband had a stable job. Her parents were doing well and her son was a happy, curious, delightful little guy. When she was able to get past her fear, the truth of who she really was came through and the natural love that flowed through her to her son spread to the rest of her family. She brought truth to fear and learned to see clearly with an open heart. Lots of people say, I work better under pressure. Fear helps me focus. Stress motivates me. I've heard it hundreds of times. Fear can be a powerful motivator, but it has serious side effects. It narrows our vision and blocks input to new information or different ways of doing things. Fear puts body and mind in crisis mode and prepares us to run, fight, or freeze. Everything not essential for survival shuts down so all our energy can be used to deal with what we perceive as an immediate threat. Crisis mode is like being chased by a bear. We don't stop and think about where we're going. We don't pay attention to what we might be stepping on or in. We don't pause to assess the best course of action. We just get the hell out of there. We don't reach out or try to understand other people when we're in crisis mode. We don't listen or learn. There's no time for creativity or new ways of seeing things. Our mind is pulled to simple, quick solutions and what seemed to work before, even when that's the worst possible thing we could do. I worked with a woman who had been in an extremely damning, <laughs> demanding job for 17 years. That was before computers and everything that came into the factory and everything that went out of it had to cross her desk. She was working 12 to 14 hours a day, six to seven days a week. It took three people to fill in for her when she was hospitalized with severe panic attacks. She came to my office the day she was released. I asked her doctor to recommend a month off work and he agreed. She learned how to restore and maintain balance using the same techniques that are described in this presentation and was doing pretty well, so she went back to work. On her first day, she saw a simple way of organizing things that saved over two hours every day. For 17 years, she worked in fear that she couldn't keep up and she never saw it. Fear had narrowed her focus and obliterated her capacity for reflection. Her brain was stuck in what she did before. That's what fear does to us. It drives us to action without thinking about the effects of our actions or considering that there might be a better way to do things. This isn't an isolated case. The U.S. Army did a study on the effects of fear on radio repairmen. They put them on an airplane and gave them the impression that they were under attack. It took two to three times longer than usual for them to complete the repair. The Business Roundtable sponsored research where they divided workers doing the same job into two equal groups based on experience and capability. One group increased their workload to 60 hours, the other stayed at 40. After three weeks, the group who worked 40 hours had produced totally more than the one that went up to 60. Exhaustion breeds fear. 
The stress response is essentially the same as our reaction to fear. The same physiological and psychological processes are activated. Both limit our perception and distort our thinking without us even knowing it. Fear accumulates over time and builds up in our bodies as tension. Tension draws our mind to ask what's wrong. Thinking about what's wrong creates more tension. This narrows our focus even more on what's wrong. It's a self-escalating process. The cumulative effect is the same as if we're being chased by a bear, but worse, because for the most part we're not aware of it. I gave my students an assignment to practice four techniques that I found help people restore balance and let go of fear a number of times a day per, for 10 consecutive days. They had a month to complete it with no other assignments too. I asked them to write a brief description of what was different after the 10 days. Every semester, they, there were reports that they accomplished more and had more energy at the end of the day, even though it took a significant amount of time out to complete the exercises. How and why these techniques work is described in the slide presentation with links to videos that show you how to use them and what to do if they don't seem to be working. My students didn't realize that what they thought was their normal way of functioning was actually pretty limited. That's one of the worst things about fear. Much of the time we're not aware of it. It's like driving to work or school. When we go there every day, we don't need to think about how to get there. We leave the driving to our brain, which has a well-established pathway based on repeated experience. It takes the same route and gets us there every time. Many of us have well-established pathways in our brains based on repeated experience of taking in messages and thinking about fear. We have learned to let fear drive us. The world is at a constant city of change and fear has us traveling by the same route to a destination unknown. The fear that permeates our modern world is not natural fear. Natural fear is a temporary reaction to a perception of a real and immediate threat. That's actually pretty rare in human interactions. And it's also not as common as we believe in nature. The only real threat in nature is when someone's hungry and sees you as lunch. Once they've eaten, the threat disappears. I was in Kenya in the 70s and saw a lion asleep on the ground next to its kill. Wildebeest were grazing nearby without any concern. The lion was a potential threat, but not at that time. Our world is full of potential threats, but very few are immediate or life-threatening. Most of our fears are a result of our own thoughts or messages we get from the media. Natural fear demands immediate action. Most of the problems we face are long-standing issues that require consideration of history, context, and the perspective of various stakeholders. But we don't think that way when we're in a state of prolonged fear. Prolonged fear leads to a condition I call fear-based thinking. Fear-based thinking is a mental habit that persists long after the perception of the threat has passed. It narrows our focus, restricts learning, blocks compassion and creativity, and makes us more self-centered, impatient, and judgmental. It makes, makes us vulnerable to manipulation and interferes with problem solving, leading us to form rigid, emotionally-based opinions that are immune to input and logic. Fear-based thinking develops and deepens when we receive repeated messages that stimulate fear. Since fear gets and keeps our attention, it's a useful tool for the media and entertainment energy. Fear is also a highly effective political tactic. It's easy to manipulate voters when fear keeps us from taking time to understand issues, question assumptions, or look behind talking points and spin. When we're in the grip of fear-based thinking, we tend to look for a strong leader to keep us safe without questioning whether he or she really has our best interests at heart. Fear-based thinking leads us to put people and information into broad, rigid categories, for, against, right, wrong, good, evil, with no space in between. We've learned to reject people who are different or disagree with us. Life is about relationships our relationships with each other and with the natural world. Meaningful relationships require authenticity and a secure sense of belonging. Fear blocks authenticity and undermines belonging. There's little chance of having fulfilling relationships when we can't be ourselves and don't feel like we fit in. Relationships are built on trust. Fear tears trust apart and dissolves it. Modern man has a, built a culture based on power over others and benefiting at the expense of others. Fear is the underside of power. It's a rare person who can hold power without fear that someone will try to take it away from them. When one benefits at the expense of others, there's a realistic fear that they will eventually seek retribution. 
An extreme example of how fear can come to dominate our lives is the white supremacy movement. It started after the Civil War when there was a well-documented political effort to turn poor whites against former slaves by presenting them as a threat to their well-being. People who had little power over their own lives were put in a position of having power over others and benefiting at their expense. White supremacists are a classic example of fear-based thinking. They blame all of the problems on, in one broad bad category of people and believe the simplistic solution that eliminating those people will solve the problem. They use violence and the threat of violence to solve problems without looking at or attempting to understand what's really going on or who they're dealing with. The movement gave them a false sense of purpose and a false sense of belonging by exclusion, which, if you think about it, isn't real belonging at all. Derek Black was one of those people. Derek Black is the godson of David Duke, the former Grand Wizard of the KKK. Derek was primed to be the future leader of the white supremacist movement. He spoke at conferences when he was like 13 years old and had his own radio program throughout his teen years. When he got to college, people found out who he was and eventually stayed clear of him. He was feeling pretty isolated when one of his classmates, a Jew, invited him to dinner with some friends on a Friday night. He had nothing else to do, so he went. They shared a meal, talked about school, and played games for a number of months before bringing up the subject of white supremacy. They asked carefully worded questions with respect and curiosity. This led to Derek asking his own questions and eventually posted a message rejecting his past. His father called him and told him he'd been hacked. He told his father he had learned the truth. His new friends had brought truth to fear. If I had to choose four words to summarize my work over the last five decades, it'd be bring truth to fear. What does it mean to bring truth to fear? When we bring truth to fear, we see the truth of what fear is, where it comes from, and what we can do about it. Once fear has lost its grip on us, we see, think, and feel more clearly. We see the truth of what's happening in the situation that's, that challenge us, the truth about the people who, believe, who we believe make our lives more difficult and the truth of who we are and what we can become. Seeking truth involves an understanding of fear, how it affects us and what we can do about it. We transform fear into caution and concern. This frees up personal resources we can take, so we can take time to understand and evaluate potential risks and danger instead of jumping to old solutions without reacting or thinking. We focus on how we can effectively deal with a situation instead of dwelling on what's wrong or what might happen. Breaking the cycle of fear-based thinking allows us to see a larger picture and relevant details more clearly. We can respond rather than react, learn, adapt, and strategize rather than grab on to what we did before. Focusing on what's going on rather than what might happen allows us to foresee obstacles and see opportunities in creative situations. That's what I'm hoping you can help your students and supporters do. Bring truth to fear so they see more clearly with more open hearts. Teach them how to transform fear into caution and concern so they can understand what's really happening and think about how best to respond. Clear the boulders of fear from their past so they can bring media literacy and social justice into their work and into their lives. I planted a six inch dogwood tree in a distant meadow on a property up north uh, back in 1991 and I assumed it didn't survive the summer's drought. I was walking in that area in the early spring, 17 years later, when I spotted it. It was almost the same size, a little bit bigger as when I planted it, but still alive. I carefully dug it up and transplanted it into our garden, which has rich organic soil and a tall, fine mesh fronts to keep out the predators. My neighbor asked me, why are you planting that chewed up spindly stick? I explained that it was a seedling that I planted all year, all those years ago. And it clearly was because I always planted in kind of a bowl and I had things around it to, to help to, to keep the moisture in. It still had life and so I wanted to see where that life would go. Now that dogwood tree is over 12 feet tall. It's covered with delicate flowers in spring and small white berries through winter. On a Christmas a number of years ago, there were five pairs of cardinals who enjoyed dinner on, our, on that dogwood tree in the garden. So I ask, what's the true nature of a garden, of a dogwood tree? Clearly, it's to grow tall and be covered with flowers that turn into berries that provide dinner for cardinals and delight for humans. 
Becoming a chewed up spindly stick was simply how the seedling adapted to ongoing threats of deer, rabbits, and drought. Removing those threats allowed the true nature of the dogwood to emerge. A respected archaeologist recently wrote that there's little evidence of war or hierarchy in the first 95% of human existence. It's only in the past few thousand years that man-made fear has dominated our consciousness. There's a couple of hypotheses. One is that agriculture started that when people uh, started owning things and gaining power over others and benefiting at the expense of others. The other hypothesis is when uh, there was a worldwide drought and tribes started invading other tribes and taking um, their food. Now, though, fear-based thinking has become a part of daily life. How have we adapted to fear-based thinking? Have we become the human equivalent of a chewed up spindly stick? What if we remove the man-made threats that keep us from recognizing and realizing our potential? What if we learn to bring truth to fear? I've put together a slide presentation that hopefully can help you and your students and supporters get started on that path. I put the core concepts and essential principles that I believe are most relevant to understanding fear and how to deal with it in a Prezi presentation. That's P-R-E-Z-I. -E, P -R -E -Z -I. I'll provide an introduction, well, I just did, and then I'll give you a tour through the screens with some comments and examples. Most of the screens contain a link to my website where you can post questions, comments, or ideas. You can pause the video to read the screen and hopefully now and then stop and think about how the content fits with your experience and how it might benefit your students. And then post your thoughts to my website. I'll write a response and if it seems like it would be helpful to others, we'll list both of them. I'll also update the core concepts and principles based on input I receive. I used to give extra credit to students who post questions that were helpful to other students doesn't really apply much uh, at this conference, but what I decided I could do is I'll send a copy of my book to the first five people who, pro who post questions or comments that are useful to others. Um, I can only send books to addresses in the United States, of course. So let's take a look at the screens and the presentation, see what we have here. Okay, this is the, the home screen, and actually I can get in there too. There I am. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, the first point is, is if, and this is really what I'm hoping to have this turn into, is, is a, a dialogue where we're exchanging information and each learning from each other. So uh, hopefully it can go in that direction. But uh, for questions and concerns, um, again, this is the basic screen that's going to be on uh, Real Common. So there, my website is right down here. And uh, here's a picture of it, and I think I can do a share screen here. Uh, am I going to do it? Yes, I am. Okay, all right. Uh, this is my website, uh, www.bringtruthtofear.com, or I'm sorry, .org. And uh, there's this is understanding fear here is is the uh, basically the outline in my book with the core principles. I basically let the narrative out. And, and just listed the core principles and uh, essential concepts. And uh, this is a little bit about media literacy, uh, which most of you are probably far beyond. This is uh, just a little presentation I gave some time ago. Uh, essentials cover um, what I find to be the, uh, or so far anyway, the essential components of a healthy, fulfilling life. And there's a number of graphics that illustrate that. Uh, this is the one where you'll get some more information though. Okay, particularly under balance, that's gonna be one of the critical ones. Um, and you'll, you'll see that uh, in the slides, and then there's videos and articles on a number of areas. And then this is the one that I really hope that you click on a lot. Um, and it'll be a list of responses, but you'll ask a question and it'll be sent to me and I'll write a response and then post them both here. If you don't want your question posted, let me know and, and it won't go uh, on the website. So uh, let's see if I can get back out of this. Stop. And... Oops. This is my first time using Prezi, so I'm going to apologize if this gets a little choppy at times. And actually, I don't think you need to be seeing me through this, so I'm just going to go in the background and talk you through the rest of it. Okay, so uh, the first part is just going to be an overview of why fear is an obstacle to media literacy and social justice. 
how it works, what goes wrong, and what works. And that's basically the outline that I'm using for all of the books that I'm that I'm working on. Okay, so um, media literacy requires an open mind and clear thinking. And the bottom line is fear is going to block that. Okay, we don't listen or take in information. Uh, it blocks compassion. We don't ask questions. We don't look at it from new perspectives. We just act without thinking and moving ahead without thinking very much or very clearly. Uh, puts us into crisis mode. So what I'm hoping you'll do here is, is hit the pause button and read through the screen and then you know ha hopefully have my website open and post questions or comments or thoughts that you have so uh, we can have a, a dialogue about this. Okay. So I'm not going to go into detail on these unless there's some new information that I think is, is helpful. I've covered uh, most of the high points uh, in the introduction. Um, this is one area, though, that, that I would like uh, you to give some thought to. It's something I've been thinking about a lot. And I ask myself the question, what are the core components of, of what we struggle with most in this world? What's, what's underlying a significant number of the problems that we face? And two things came to mind, uh, benefiting at the expense of others and seeking power over others. And both of those create an inherent fear that, that feeds resistance to change. Um, and misleading and misinformation are often intentionally designed to generate fear. So in many respects, media literacy is an uphill climb against those forces that are creating those obstacles. So we need to be aware of that and take into account and figure out how to respond to, to in a way that's going to be effective over the long run. Okay, how it works. So the essential functions related to fear I've broken down into body, mind, and emotions. Okay, um, body is the place to start. And we'll go into that a little bit later. But there are two essential functions uh, in dealing with the, the body, um, in in getting past fear and, and uh, uh, restoring some balance. Uh, the first is the autonomic nervous system. That's the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. The, the function of this nervous system is to supply energy to various parts of the body. Okay, The sympathetic nervous system energizes your muscles so that using that when you're running, when you're doing physical work, or when you're building up tension, unfortunately. The parasympathetic nervous system, the opposite part of that, uh, handles all the maintenance work. Digest your foods, fight off disease, so forth. Those two work opposite each other. They're never both on at the same time. One suppresses the other and the sympathetic tends to become dominant in modern life. Okay, uh, So what happens to the sympathetic is the parasympathetic shuts down and, and that sends us off to the races and, and that's when we stop thinking very clearly. So here's a, a bit of a description of the two of those uh, with a little more detail. And then the buildup of tension is another component of that. And when we're aware of the buildup of tension and can stop it, we can break that self-escalating process where the tension draws our mind to the problem and that creates more tension. And so there's a little more information about that. Okay, effective the mind, core functions of the mind. The mind. I find it really helpful um, uh, to explain to people how your brain organizes our thinking. And uh, I found that the analogy of using a road is really helpful because uh, thoughts, ideas, and memories are connections between neurons. Okay? And, and it is really a pathway. They call it a pathway. And it's very much like a road system. And the more you repeat an experience, the, the, it's like the road becomes paved and it's easier to travel on it faster and you can get on it without thinking. And so there's all kinds of roads on this map of Ann Arbor. Some of them are little dirt roads off in this area. And then there's a couple of highways that are paved with limited access. Okay, And this is kind of how our brain operates. We've got some really fast roads, like I use the example of driving to work. Um, but we've got a number of ways to get to different places. And the fast roads have enough exits so we can get there. Okay, uh, So this describes that process. and. And the process essentially is that our brain is forming. It's not a fixed thing. It's not a computer. It's always adapting to, to the changing circumstances if we allow it to. Okay, if we've got if we're stuck on those highways or or worse uh, into railroad tracks. Okay, uh, that's fear-based thinking. That's what happens then. 
Okay, so this is, explains a little bit more detail of the road analogy. And uh, I don't know if I mentioned, but I, I want you to I mean, feel free to use any of these screens. And if you'd like a, a link to the presentation that you can use yourself in your classroom, uh, please send me an email. I'd be happy to send that to you. Uh, I'll, uh, and I'll have this uh, posted on my website, too, so you can go through the presentation uh, at your leisure as well. Okay, limits on perception. This is another area that uh, I found to be very helpful in, in working with students and, and patients, uh, understanding how we perceive things because emotions are dependent on perception. It's, it's, it's the perception that draws our emotion and when you switch the perception, the emotion changes. And I found that there are three components to perception that, that uh, made a difference when we understood how they work. And this is an analogy from photography. So there's a frame, like the frame that you see through the viewfinder or frame of a picture. The filter is the emotional component. Okay, the frame is the conceptual component. It's, it's the sum of our experiences and our understanding uh, of what the world is about and the messages from our culture and the norms that we live by. That creates our frame. Okay. The filter, as I said, is the emotional thing and that colors the experience. Um, I worked with a guy once who um, came in with a problem. He had a, a really good friend that he'd had for a number of years. They went on a trip together and got into a big argument about money at the end somehow, who was going to pay for what. And uh, he was really upset and um, I asked him, um, well, how important was the friendship to him? And I said, it's, you know, it's really important. I've known this guy for over 20 years. And I said, well, how much money is involved and how important is that, you know, given your budget? And he thought about it and he said, well, really, it's not that much. It's not that important. I said, well, what's the relationship between the two? He said, oh my God, um, okay. And so let's, you know, I said, uh, craft a letter that, that simply uh, uh, tells him that you're willing to agree to what he thinks is fair. Uh, you said he's a reasonable guy, try that. And he did, sent them the email, a very nicely worded email. He brought it in the next time along with the response, which was really shocking. The guy was really angry, okay? His friend just, just tore into him. And I read it, and it was clear, clear that uh, first thing, that he had read the email, and secondly, he had missed the most important part, <laughs> okay? And I said, send him an email with caps letters, please read the previous email. And he did that, and the guy read it more slowly this time, and they worked everything out. Okay, so the filter can block us from seeing things that are valid and important. And the focus is what we pay attention to at any given moment. Uh, and in stress, our focus gets fo narrow and, and scattered. And what we want is to be able to focus where the needs of the situation um, uh, indicate and keeping in touch with our values and our purpose. Okay. And now I've touched on this a little bit, understanding the nature of emotions, uh, which of course the, the nature of fear is part of that. And down here I talk about three different kinds of emotions. And this is a, a functional understanding of emotion based on how best to deal with them. That's, there's lots of different ways of categorizing and looking at emotions. And uh, I'm thinking, I'm talking about the, what I consider to be the basic emotions. And that's fear, hurt, sadness, and joy. Uh, I find that all the other emotions really can be combinations of those or their complications with our, with our complicated by our thinking. Um, so tension affects emotion, okay? Emotion is an experience in the body and, and it's physical. And actually with the proper equipment, you can even observe subtle movements in the musculature when people are experiencing different emotions. But the way to stop those emotions is to tense. If you see someone say to a little boy, this is more common in the past, but big boys don't cry. Okay, what do they do? They go, <laughs> they tense up, hold their breath, stop crying, it works. Okay, problem is now they're carrying all of this tension with them. Okay, and that adds to the stress response, the fear response, and ultimately to fear-based thinking. So fear puts us into crisis mode, and that's how it gets started, and that's how we keep it going, and that self-escalating process that I talked about before. So we get to the three kinds of fear, which is a, a variation of the three kinds of emotion. Uh, there's natural fear, mental fear, and what I call structural fear. Okay, natural fear is a natural threat that's immediate, it's dangerous, we need to act immediately. Okay, we deal with that much differently than we deal with mental fear. Okay? Um, 
When I worked with people who had problems with violence, I had dozens of situations where I had to go in and where someone was acting out and, and manage the situation and calm them down. And I didn't feel afraid in those times because my focus was on understanding where they were coming from and what they needed and what was going on. So when you shift the focus, okay, then you can think more clearly. If you're just reacting, you're going to come in and fight or run and make a mess of things. Uh, there was a guy that, um, another psychologist, uh, when I wasn't there, uh, came running down the hall when there was a, a problem at the unit where I was working and ran in and got his jaw broken. Okay, <laughs> that didn't help anything at all. Okay, mental fear is the main problem that we deal with. It has the same physical and psychological effects as natural fear, but it lasts as long as we think about it. And it is a response to our perception, but our perception is dominated by our thinking. So we can get stuck there. And that's, that's where we can, understanding how your brain works and making a different pathway, recognizing, okay, I see where this road's taking me, I'm gonna take a different road. And you make that road uh, a number of ways, and I'll describe that later on. Structural fear is the tension that gets loaded into our body and the habits of thinking in our brain that feed that tension, and they feed each other, of course. And so uh, undoing that and getting out of that is actually a fairly simple and straightforward process, although it is very challenging and difficult at times. Okay, how it works is covered. Let's go to what goes wrong, okay? Well, the big deal is that fear becomes embedded in our lives. In the modern world, it's all around us, okay? You can't get away from it, okay? It it's, starts early on in school, okay? You're, everyone's graded and you've got to, they use fear, I have to get this done or I'm gonna flunk or I'm not gonna pass or I'm not gonna get into this or that. Um, we're based in competition. Um, it's, it's, our work, is, it seems like we're never good enough. And the news, if I, I just watched a, a program, uh, and this was PBS, um, and just kept track of the number of, of segments that were fear, you know, stimulated some fear in me. And like three quarters of the segments were, were you know, it's like, oh my God, that's bad. Oh my God, that's bad. It happens again and again. It just keeps on feeding it. And of course, our politics, uh, they've become very good at using fear as a, as a tactic to manipulate voters. It permeates our entertainment system and video games. Whoops, go back here again. Um, it's described as a way of motivation. We talked about that a little bit. And then I, I mentioned briefly the uh, inherent fears. And uh, those are power and privilege, okay? And the fear of judgment and not belonging, okay? And there's an inherent fear um, because our culture somehow promotes this idea that we need to judge ourselves and others. We need to somehow fit in and that belonging is contingent on how we appear and what we do and how much we accomplish. And so we never really feel grounded in our life. We never really have a sense of belonging. And this creates an ongoing set of imbalance and insecurity. Um, and then power and privilege, I mentioned earlier, it just has this underlying fear because of the, of the consequences of, of doing those things, okay? Okay, fear becomes embedded in our body. I've talked about this quite a bit already. Uh, crisis mode, there's a little summary there of how that works and the effects of crisis mode and a little bit more detail in terms of the stress hormones and how that keeps that going. And then the sympathetic nervous system, uh, again, a little more detail on that, how it becomes overloaded and how it gets fed through the, the stress hormones and how the liver operates through that process. Um, and then the continuous buildup of tension, how that activates the self-escalating process that we talked about. Okay, and then the mind, okay? Remember the mind is, when there's tension, it's drawn to potential threats, okay? Um, it's a little bit about that and restricted awareness. It shrinks and stiffens our frame, okay? There's a little bit of a summary of that. Makes it more rigid and, and resistant to change. It darkens the filter, like the example I told you about the guy who almost lost a friendship uh, because of a dark filter. Um, and it fixes and scatters our focus. And that's a little more of the detail on that. And again, I designed these screens hoping that they might be helpful in something that uh, that you could use. And if you want them as a, as a PowerPoint, I generated most of them in PowerPoint, I can also uh, uh, send you a copy of the PowerPoint if that's helpful to you. Okay, 
and then fear-based thinking. That's where fear becomes structured in the brain and the body. Remember the picture I showed you of what is essentially a representation of a healthy brain? Here's the brain on fear-based thinking. There's just no exit. This is what we see and that's all we get. And that's a little bit more of a description of fear-based thinking and a graphic that shows how we get stuck in there and what it leads to and what it restricts. Uh, how it affects us, all different parts of our lives, and the, how it's a highly effective political and media tactic. Here's some of the sources of fear-based thinking, and here's some ways to recognize it. If you see these, then you might think, oh, we got something going on here. I need to take that into consideration if I wanted to have any influence over that person. Okay, and now back to what works, okay? The key is to transform fear into caution and concern. There are really real things that we need to fear, but when we transform it to caution and concern, then we have our resources to think about it okay, and deal with it. And I've got a lot of information here on restoring balance because that's the first step. Uh, when you've got your autonomic nervous system in balance and basically the parasympathetic nervous system is default is the key to that, so it's on most of the time, then you're not in crisis mode and you can function more effectively and more efficiently. And there's a lot of myths about that that feed the problem that we have. Um, Got to work hard, long hours. Um, it just uh, doesn't work, okay? Uh, here's some of the effects of being out of balance. Some research on overwork. Uh, there's lots of that out there. If that's something good to, to Google and to check into, there's a lot of good stuff there. Uh, some quotes, uh, basically, uh, from uh, Harvard Business Review. Uh, keep overworking and you'll progressively work more stupidly on tasks that are increasing meaningless. And I've seen that throughout my career, um, unfortunately. Um, and fear causes a lot of imbalance, okay? It, it leads to all the problems that, that um, we deal with and struggle with. They're not all of them, but most of them anyway. And then the interaction of body, mind, and emotion. And they're not separate things, okay? They're, they're, we're one person and we have a body, just like you know, I have two hands, but they're connected and they work together, okay? Um, and, uh, but we break it down for convenience in terms of understanding, but they all influence each other. They're intertwined and one is gonna have an effect on the other. And so here's what works. We start by restoring physical balance. We start with the body that I just learned again and again, over and over throughout my career, that starting with the body, made everything easier. When the physical tension is, is being resolved and the parasympathetic nervous system is default, it's much easier to work at habits of thinking and to deal with patterns of emotional tension and, and trauma and things like that. So here's what works with the grounding. <clears throat> uh, this is the same website that's referred to here, um, but there's three videos that are particularly relevant to that that are the essential techniques that I found to be uh, consistently helpful and in restoring that balance. And, uh, and th there's also one on dealing with obstacles to the breathing. Uh, so if it's not working, uh, it's, I, I did a, a taped uh, interview with a student who was struggling with learning the natural rhythmic breathing. And so I went through all of the, the problem solving with her uh, until she was able to do it. Um, and then here's the process of, of uh, uh, restoring clear thinking and what works in dealing with emotion. Now these videos, um, I don't think they're all on my new website, so you can go to my old website. That's down here, bobbinostrow.com. Um, and the videos, I think there's a, a lot of my videos are on YouTube, so you can find them there as well. Um, but here's what health looks like, uh, the physical, emotional components, thought and perception, okay? And balance is a choice, okay? When we balance a high priority, our lives are better. We live a more effective life uh, with more compassion and understanding. We get along better. Everything's easier when we're in balance. Uh, this is a, um, I give a two hour presentation um, on uh, balance. And here's a PowerPoint uh, handout that I use for that. So this is on my website and you can access that if you're, if you're interested. Okay, dealing with our own fear three core principles. Um, I used these principles for 35 years, incorporated them into my class, and uh, never found a situation where applying these principles in this order uh, didn't help move things in a healthy direction. Uh, 
Okay, so we always start with balance. The three principles, you can think of them as A, B, C, but just start with balance um, for the reasons I described earlier. Okay, and that's balance in the body and balance in the mind and emotion. And here's the, the parasympathetic nervous system as default, natural rhythm and breathing gets you there, and developing awareness of when tension starts to build and grounding helps you to do that. There are other techniques that work, but those I have found to be consistently effective and they kind of underline what's happening when those other techniques are effective. For mind and emotion, okay, we want to recognize where our mind is going and learn to redirect it as needed. And there's just some of the techniques here for that and how the process works. And then expanding the awareness, creating a flexible frame, a clear filter, and adaptable focus and some concepts about how to do that. And again, there's videos on that go into that and I'll have some more videos in the future on this part. I don't think I cover that very fully on video yet. Okay, now accept. Uh, this is just a brief description of it, uh, but basically it, it means you just accept things where they are. That's the starting point for, for dealing with things and moving in a healthy direction. And we also accept other people where they are we separate their behavior and their beliefs from who they really are underneath that. Recognize that, that things that are causing problems or pain for other people generally are a distortion of who they really are. And if we can connect with who they really are and allow that to come through, just like those guys at, co at that college where Derek Brack attended, uh, were patient and respectful of him and wound up transforming his life and he's gone on to, to uh, transform lots of other people's lives. Okay, clarifying your own fear. Okay, so identifying that source of fear is really helpful. I think I touched on that a little bit. Is there an immediate threat? Okay, what are some things you need to look at there? When it's mental fear, here's where to go. When it's structural fear, here's the process. And then, of course, you want to ask questions and then have a process of deepening our understanding. Okay. Okay, I went through that one last week, back up. I went too fast here. Transform fear into caution and concern. Oops, I jumped a screen. I lost one somewhere. Sorry about that. We're supposed to go back to the main screen and this is um, dealing with fear in others. Okay, here's what doesn't work when you're dealing with someone who's stuck in fear-based thinking or, or reacting out of fear. First of all, logic just simply doesn't work. Confrontation just makes them more defensive. Judgment makes them more resentful. Rejection turns them away from you. Isolating them just breeds contempt. Okay, here's what does work. And I think I've covered a lot of that and that's in the videos, but basically you want to expand your own filter first, or I'm sorry, expand your own frame, clear your own filter, and focus on understanding the others and where they come from and what they need. Okay, and helping others move through fear, some steps to that, uh, that I found to be consistently effective. And the effect of relationships on frames, filter, and focus, and, and understanding how we can transform that through how we relate to others. And then expanding our own frame makes it easier for others to expand theirs. Okay, so what we wanna do is, when we have two frames and they don't overlap, okay, we're not gonna solve anything. We have to somehow bring our frame over their frame so we can see how they see things. And here's some ideas on how to do that. Okay, how to expand our frames. And there's four components to that that I found to be consistently helpful. I won't go into any detail on them, but I've got descriptions that are pretty carefully worded and I think describe it pretty well. Compassion, personal responsibility, hope, and humility. And we change minds by opening hearts. Here's the example. I used Derek Black uh, in the earlier and Christian Piccolini um, was the uh, band leader um, and one of the leaders of the, the Nazi movement in the United States and in Germany. And uh, uh, he was transformed uh, by a customer who came into his shop. Um, and uh, Megan Phelps Roper um, was a woman who carried signs, actually as a young girl, uh, protesting, saying that uh, going to funerals of, of gays and people who were killed in war, uh, saying they were going to hell. Um, this is a very beautiful story with uh, Johnny Clary and Reverend Watts. Um, Johnny Clary was a, a Ku Klux Klan uh, uh, leader and uh, Reverend Watts uh, transformed him with a very uh, uh, touching and actually funny story if you could look up. 
Uh, Daryl Davis is a jazz musician who's kind of made it his, his mission to reach out to people uh, who were racist and to, to understand where they're coming from and make connections with them. And he's, he's uh, transformed a number of people's lives by establishing healthy relationships with them. Okay, so here's a little summary. Media literacy requires emotional literacy. Social justice involves improving relationships as well as changing laws. How do we do that? Okay, here's the components of healthy relationships, and uh, here's some of the core issues that I think are critical in that process. And uh, this is a screen, it's on my website, um, but the essential components of a healthy, fulfilling life. Um, balance, awareness, truth, and belonging. And it's the process of removing obstacles to be ourselves. Okay, it allows our true nature to come through. Um, and they have to go in this order. It's hard to work on belonging when someone's out of balance. It's hard to really get a sense of seeking the truth when they're out of balance. So here's the components, the subcomponents, and the process under that. And uh, on my website, I've got subscreens on all of these and, and a lot of detail that, that goes further into that. And that's been a, kind of an ongoing project that I've been working on for um, a long time. Okay, this is the dogwood tree. Um, oh my God, it's about... Uh, six years ago it's now probably four feet taller than that um, but i'd like to leave you with that thought that was a tiny little stick 17 years old okay that it was just chewed up and going nowhere and now look what it is and think about what we can be if we eliminate uh, that focus on the threats in our lives okay i really appreciate you uh, sticking with this whole thing and, and uh, it's uh, a long one um, but I hope that this is helpful to you, and, and please uh, contact me if you have questions, and feel free to use this material and share it with your students or anyone who may benefit from it. And as I said, if you would uh, like to have a copy of the, of the presentation, I can send you a link to that. Uh, I have more information on the website, and I can also send you the, uh, the PowerPoint that it's based on. Okay? Okay, thank you very much. Good luck to you, and take care.